Praise the Lord. Rise up as we pray together, preparing our hearts and lives, preparing to listen to the word, that the word will have a real conspicuous place in every heart and every life. Open your mouth and pray to the Lord. That as we come to the Bible study today, the Lord will speak to your heart. You have a receiving heart, a believing heart, and that rejoices in the word. Glad and happy, rejoicing that the Lord is sending the word unto you like he does to no other person. That the great privilege the Lord has given us to come hear the word, learn the word, study the word every week like this. That that privilege will be a fruit in your heart, in my heart, in our lives together. Pray that God will make you simple, sincere, humble, righteous before the Lord. That you give the honor to the Lord that is due his name. You appreciate the Father sending his spirit, the spirit of truth, to guide you, lead you into the truth of the word. As it takes us step by step, chapter after chapter, word, verse after verse, giving us proper interpretation and proper application of the word. Pray that the Lord will help you to receive the word, believe the word, and let this word work effectually. Your heart and life. And then when you go out to places where the Lord will direct you, that you will not forget the word he has been teaching us. You remember to apply the word to every situation of your life. Present yourself before the Lord that whatever will hinder the maximum greatest benefit in the world. In your life, the Lord will take it away. Wandering thoughts, restlessness, thinking about another thing while you're in the presence of the Lord, being distracted, your mind, your heart, your spirit, your soul, your heart, that God will take all those distractions away from your heart. And you'll concentrate on the word of God, the word of life. Pray that this word will help you to go higher and higher. You experience and work with the Lord. And the same thing the Lord has done for the people we're reading about. Especially Daniel at this time in Babylon. That the Lord will give you the same shining experience. Make you model around you to the people that see you, the people that observe your life, that they'll see that kind of model or seen in Daniel. It's all by grace, and that grace that was abundantly sufficient for him can be sufficient for you too. If you will ask, the Lord will give you. Daniel started just like we started. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. We all start at the same level. But he came to God, turned away from sin, and allowed the plan of God, the atonement, provided for him. He allowed that to forgive him, to wash him, to cleanse him, to purge him. And allowed the Lord to have the preeminence in his life. Every step of the way. That's how he became what he became. That's how we too can become what we ought to be. Forgiven, cleansed, purged, purified, sanctified, made righteous, made holy. Coming under the direct control and guidance of the Spirit of God. Walking every step of the way. 
the strength and the might of the Spirit of God. That's what he did. And an excellent spirit was found in him. That's what we can do. You can do it too. And that same excellent spirit will be found in you. And you live a life glorifying to God. A life pleasing to the Lord. A life rapturable. Because of abundant grace in your life. God has done it for all the people. They can do it for you too. Pray that as God is blessing you and blessing us here. It will bless all, all the people gathered together. Anywhere, everywhere. Learning the same word that we are learning. Studying the same word that we are studying. That this same grace, strength, love and power, ability, divine strength. The Lord is giving us here. He will be giving them to you. As the word is working effectually, effectively in our hearts and our lives. That the word will work effectually, effectively to you. In the life of everyone studying together with us. Let's pray for the new believers that have just come to know the Lord. That at this time they'll find the word of God precious to them. And the Lord will be directing them in their young Christian life to stand by the word. Whatever persecution, whatever opposition they experience, that the Lord will strengthen them. Within, in the inner man. And they will be strong in the Lord. And those of us who have known the Lord for some time. Walking with the Lord and walking in the spirit and not in the flesh. That God will help us to keep on appreciating. What the Lord is revealing to us. Every time as we come. Pray that you'll not be weak. You'll not be tired. You will not be weary. You will not be fed up with the word of God. You will not push the Lord away. Saying, we don't want to hear. We don't want to know. Pray that the Lord will give you a heart desirous. Passionate and willing. Hungry and thirsty. Thirsty and hungry. For this living bread and the water of life. Pray that God will so help you and write his word upon the tables of your heart. And day by day, the light of the word will be shining across your pathway, helping and guiding you, assisting you and supporting you to live the life that brings glory and honor unto the Lord. That the Lord should reveal to you things you've never known. To make you hear things you've never heard. To take you to higher ground. As you learn in the presence of the Lord today. Hold nothing back from the Lord. Lay everything upon the altar. Say, Lord, not my will, thy will be done. Not my way. Thy way be supreme in my life. Not what I want, what you will, what you want. What pleases and satisfies you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Heavenly Father, we bless your name once again for our Bible study. Thank you for this special privilege you have given us. Thank you for your people, the interest and the love. You have given your people to come together like this once a week. So we can study the word together. We pray, Lord, as we dig deep into your word tonight. We pray, Lord, you reveal your mind, your will, your word to everyone in Jesus' name. We pray that things we have never seen or known. And things we've never heard. And things we've never observed. You reveal to your people in Jesus' name. The strength and the power. The grace that goes along with your word. We pray to flow with your word. And you enrich every life with that grace and strength and power. And divine ability in Jesus' name. 
Bless your people tonight. Lift your people higher to higher ground in Jesus' name. We pray for those who are here and we pray for all those who are still coming. And we pray for those who are studying with us in all the various locations in this nation, in this continent of Africa and beyond. And we pray, Lord, your blessing will enrich them as it's enriching us here in Jesus' name. Thank you, Lord, because we know you have answered. In Jesus' name we pray. Thank you very much. You can see that. We're coming back to Daniel. Daniel chapter 6. We've been in Daniel now for a number of weeks, a number of months. And it's worth it all. As we look at what the Lord has been revealing unto us. Tonight's study looks like a very special study. Very special in the sense that it's all over the Bible from the beginning to the end. And yet, many, many readers of the Bible, and many, many students of the Bible, and even many ministers and servants of God who have touched the Bible almost from cover to cover, they are ignorant, or we are ignorant of this sin the Lord is revealing to us tonight. New Testament believers who should have known what the Lord is saying tonight, it appears that it is something that has not been our heart. And that's the reason why we're taking this special time to dig into the Word of God and say, what do the Scriptures say about this? Is this only in the Old Covenant? Or is it also in the New Covenant? Let's see, we're looking at Daniel chapter 6, verses 25 and 26, with the emphasis on the first part of verse 26. Verse 25, Then King Darius wrote unto all people and nations and languages that dwell in all the earth, and peace be multiplied unto you. I make a decree that in every dominion of my kingdom, Men tremble and fear before the God of Daniel. For he is the living God and steadfast forever. And his kingdom that which shall not be destroyed. And his dominion shall be even unto the end. And everybody said, Amen. Amen. There's something we're looking at in verse 26. I'm going to read that first part of verse 26 again for you to notice. In verse 26, I make a decree that in every dominion of my kingdom, men tremble and fear before the God of Daniel, for he is the living God. Those two words, tremble and fear. Tremble and fear. The first time you read that, you think, oh, that's a pagan. You think that's a heathen. You think that's an unbeliever. You think that's a sinner. And because he is a sinner, because he is a pagan, that's why it says you fear God and you tremble before God. No, that's not the word of a pagan. No, that's not the idea of a heathen. No, that's not the disposition of a sinner. It says, I make a decree. That in every dominion of my kingdom, men tremble and fear before God. To tremble and to fear. You know, the first time people see that, they want to know me. I'm not going to fear God. I'm not going to tremble before God because I'm a child of God. I'm a child of the covenant. The Lord has washed away my sins. And the Lord has saved me. And because the Lord has saved me, fear is gone. No, I don't fear God. No, I don't tremble before God. That's the false attitude of a person that is ignorant of the word of God. Now pick those two words and let's run through the Bible and find out. What does God himself say? So that you will know that this is not something that the man just caught up on his own. This is the very mind of God, the will of God, the word of God. In Jeremiah chapter 5, I'm reading from verse 22. Jeremiah chapter 5, verse 22. It says, Fear ye me not, says the Lord. Will ye not tremble at my presence, which have placed the sand for the bound of the sea by a perpetual decree, that it cannot pass it, 
and though the weights thereof tossed themselves, yet can they not prevail, though they roar, yet can they not pass over it. See the Lord Almighty himself asking the people of Israel, and he's saying, I blessed you. I've redeemed you. I've called you out of captivity. And I've protected you and preserved you from all your enemies. Will you not fear me? Will you not tremble before me? Those are the true words that Darius used. And he said, you fear and you tremble before this living God. We're looking at Psalm 2. We're looking at Psalm 2, verse 11. And then I'll go on to verse 12. Psalm 2, verse 11. It says, serve the Lord with fear and rejoice with trembling. Those are the two words again, to fear and to tremble. And you see, this one is this not a pagan. In fact, Psalm 2 is a psalm for the Messiah. That's where the Lord said in verse 6, Yet have I set my king upon my holy hill of Zion. I will declare the decree. In verse 7, the Lord has said unto me, Thou art my son, this day have I begotten thee. Verse it has cup me, and I shall give thee the heathen for thine inheritance, and the uttermost parts of the earth for thy possession. Now it says in verse 10, Be wise now, therefore, O ye kings, and be instructed, ye judges of the earth. Serve the Lord with fear and rejoice with trembling. And so you see, as we talk about fearing God and trembling before God, that's not just the word of King Darius. That's the word you find in the Old Testament and New Testament in Jeremiah chapter 33. Jeremiah chapter 33. I'm reading to you from verse 6. You see, there are some people that say, no, I'm not going to fear God or tremble before God. After all, it's such a loving God. I depend upon the promises of God. And I am standing with joy and I'm standing with confidence and faith in the promises of the Lord. And they say, where you are faith in God, you cannot tremble before God. Where you are faith in God and you trust Him and you have confidence in Him, how can you be trembling before Him? Look at this now. In Jeremiah chapter 33, I'm reading from verse 6. But I will bring it health and kill. And I will kill them and will reveal unto them the abundance of peace and truth. Say amen to that. That's the promise of the Lord is giving us. But he continues and he says in verse 7, And I will cause the captivity of Judah and the captivity of Israel to return and will build them as such the force. And I will cleanse them from all the iniquity whereby they have sinned against me. And I, and I will pardon all the iniquities whereby they have sinned and whereby they have transgressed against me. Have you noticed those wonderful promises from verse 6 to verse 8 I will heal them I will cleanse them, I will pardon them, I will take away their iniquity, they will become mine. And now in verse 9, and it shall be to me a name of joy and a praise and an honor before all the nations of the earth, which shall hear all the good that I do unto them, and they shall fear and tremble. See that? In fulfilling the promises that he has made, cleansing us, healing us, forgiving us, delivering us, taking away our yoke, and taking away our captivity, it says, because of that, because we experience his grace, and because we experience his love, and because his forgiveness is given unto us, therefore it says, they shall fear and tremble for all the goodness and for all the prosperity that I, will, that I procure unto each. Which means then, and we don't say, well, because God is so good and God is so wonderful and God is so loving and God is so gracious and God is a partner God, therefore we're not going to fear him and we're not going to tremble before him. It, Darius said, I make a decree because of the great thing the Lord has done. In Daniel and for Daniel and through Daniel, let all the people, all the men in my dominion and my kingdom, let them fear and tremble before this God, the living God, the God of Daniel. Say, but that's all Old Testament. And in the Old Testament, it says, fear God. In the Old Testament, it says, tremble before God. How about the New Testament? Let's see in Philippians chapter 2, verse 12. 
Philippians chapter 2. I'm reading from verse 12. And you understand that uh, what I'm telling you is that what King Darius said, those are not the words of a pagan or the words of a heathen or the words of a sinner or the words of somebody who does not know God. This is a person that now knew and saw the power, the might, the manifestation of the glory of God. And because of that manifestation, demonstration of the power, the might, and the glory of God, it says, fear God and tremble before this living God. In Philippians chapter 2, I'm reading verse 12. Wherefore, my beloved, as ye have always obeyed, not as in my presence only, but now much more in my absence, walk out your own salvation with what? With fear and trembling. Those two words again were fear and trembling. So you understand now what we're studying today that many, many people are ignorant of and they do not have the fear of God in their hearts. They do not tremble before the Almighty God. In fact, it's like they almost will be so familiar with God that they will. Uh, kind of assault him but it says that you serve him and you work out your own salvation with fear and trembling i'm looking at second corinthians second corinthians chapter seven in second corinthians chapter seven we're looking at verse 15 and his inward affection is more abundant toward you Whilst he, whilst he remembers the obedience of you all, how were fear and trembling ye received him? You see that again, those two words were fear and trembling. And so then, as we come to the word today, we're looking at what Darius said, and we're going to look at what the scriptures will teach us about our attitude towards the Lord, about our disposition towards the Lord, about our relationship towards the Lord about our lifestyle or based on the word of God. I'm coming back to Daniel chapter 6. We're looking at verses 25 and 26. In verse 25, then King Darius wrote unto all people, nations and languages that dwell in all the earth, peace be multiplied unto you. I say peace be multiplied unto you. And then in verse 26, now I make a decree that in every dominion of my kingdom men tremble and fear before the God of Daniel for he is the living God and steadfast forever and he said his kingdom that which shall not be destroyed and his dominion shall be even unto, unto the edge. You see the decree is an official order a royal statute, a ruler's command of the law made by a king, an order with power of legislation issued by a king and or any person with authority. King Darius had signed an earlier decree. That was the decree that sent Daniel into the lion's den. That if anybody will pray to any other god except unto Darius for these 30 days, he'll be thrown into the lion's den. He signed that decree. That was a temporary decree just for 30 days. And that was an unrighteous decree. Not only that, it was a decree inspired by sin. By jealousy and envy, the envy and the jealousy of those presidents and the princes and the persecutors. It was a decree inspired by self. They wanted self-exaltation. They wanted to destroy Daniel so that they could lift up themselves. It was a decree inspired by Satan. But now he has another decree. This new decree was not temporary, but timeless. And this new decree was not unrighteous, but righteous. This new decree was not inspired by Satan, but inspired by God himself. It is a universal decree because it says it's unto all people. It's unto all nations. It's for every man in my dominion, in my kingdom. And it's also an unchangeable decree. And it says it's in every place and at all times that this must be observed. In fact, as you look at the Bible, you are going to find out the prophets of the Old Testament and the preachers of the New Testament, the angels of God in heaven and Jesus Christ himself all say the same thing, that we need to fear God, we need to honor God, we need to exalt God, and we need to serve 
God with fear and trembling. And I pray that you, if you call yourself a Christian, you will not relegate the words of Jesus Christ behind you in Jesus' name. You will not trample under the words of the Lord, or the words of Lord Jesus Christ under your feet. You'll take the words of Jesus so seriously that this is what Jesus has said. And because Jesus has said it, you'll honor the Lord and you'll have the word of Jesus Christ inscribed and printed upon the tables of your earth. What did Jesus say? We should ever fear God. Let's look at Luke chapter 12. In Luke chapter 12, I'm reading from verse, reading from verse 4. Luke chapter 12, verse 4. Here is the Lord Jesus Christ himself, the very Son of God, and the one that knows the Father very well, and he knows the relationship we ought to have between the people who are forgiven, and then God was forgiving us. Here is what Jesus Christ said about the attitude we ought to have, the disposition we ought to manifest, and the fear we ought to manifest in the presence of the Almighty God. In Luke chapter 12, verse 4, but, and I say unto you, my friends, he was not talking to sinners, he was talking to his friends, his disciples, the people who have come to make reconciliation with the Almighty God through the atonement of the Lord Jesus Christ. Those were his friends, the disciples, the believers. And he says, And I say unto you, my friends, be not afraid of them that kill the body. And after that, they have no more that they can do. But I will forewarn you, whom ye shall fear. Fear him, which after he has killed, has power to cast into hell. Yea, I say unto you, do what? Fear him. Those are the words of the Lord Jesus Christ. And if Jesus Christ would say that, then you know that that word is real and that word is true. And if you're a real child of God, if you respect Christ and honor Christ, and if you exalt Christ in your heart, in your life, you will take the words of Jesus Christ very seriously, as he has said, that we fear him. Because he has the power to kill, to destroy. He has the power to judge sinners and then to drive them and draw them and pull them and send them into hell fire forever and ever and jesus christ said i say unto you do you watch fear him we're looking at revelation chapter 14 verse 6 revelation chapter 14 verse 6 here is an angel now coming from heaven saying the same thing so you will know that what Darius the king said is not just the words of an ignorant king a pagan king a heathen king a sinful king these are words inspired by the almighty god himself in the revelation chapter 14 verse 6 and i saw another angel fly in the midst of heaven having what tell me out loud the everlasting gospel to preach unto them that dwell on the face of on the earth and to every nation and kindred and tongue and people saying with a loud voice do what fear god that's gospel, the everlasting gospel that that angel proclaimed and preached and declared. In that everlasting gospel included, fear God and give glory to him for the hour of his judgment is come. And worship him that made heaven and earth and the sea and the fountains of waters. This decree then is not merely the decree of an earthly king. It is the decree of an everlasting eternal king. The decree of God is his eternal, unchangeable, holy, wise, sovereign purpose. The will of the infinite, absolute, and eternal, unchanging God. It demands from small and great. It demands from the beginning of creation to the unending eternity that we're going to have, and it demands that we fear him. In view of his infinite greatness and man's total dependence on him, men ought to tremble and fear before God, the living God. The living God is the eternal God who has life in himself. He is the fountain of life. Without him, there is no life. He is the author and the giver of life. He said first and forever. He abides and he lives forever while presidents and princes and persecutors and governors and counselors and captains rise and fall while they live and die. All things change, but he is unchangeable. His kingdom that which shall not be destroyed. 
no human power can prevail against him. And his kingdom is upheld by his, uh, by his omnipotence, his might, his power, his omnipotence is irresistible. All the earth will fear him. The saints do fear him now. Sinners will fear him at the white throne judgment. And throughout all eternity, demons tremble and fear now in anticipation of the coming judgment. And sinners and demons and Satan will fear God throughout eternity while suffering the torment in hell fire. That's why now we need to be wise and carry out this word that King Darius had uh, told us. So that we can manifest a kind of heart and a kind of spirit and a kind of attitude and a kind of disposition that we need to manifest and everyone that is wise. Wise in art will manifest such attitude as well. Fear God and serve Him with fear, rejoice with trembling. I'm looking at some two again. Some two. We're looking at it from verse 10 all through to verse 12. Some two, verse 10. Be wise now, therefore, in view of everything we have said. In view of the power of the Almighty God, in view of the coming judgment coming upon sinners who are careless and carnal and evil, fear him now, therefore, O ye kings, be instructed, ye judges of the earth, serve the Lord with fear and rejoice with trembling. Kiss the Son, embrace the Son, love the Son, trust in the Son, accept the Son. That's the Son of the living God, the Lord Jesus Christ. Lest he be angry and ye perish from the way when his wrath is kindled. But in a little, blessed are all they that put their trust in him. As we dig deep into the word of God tonight and we look at these words from Daniel chapter 6 verse 26 in particular. We're going to divide the study into three parts. Number one, the decree of an earthly king. Yes, Darius was an earthly king and he made this new decree. We're going to look at that decree and look at what the scriptures have to say concerning that decree. Number two, the demand of the eternal king, the king in heaven, the king of heaven and earth, the God of heaven and earth. What is his demand? We're going to look at number three, the delight of the everlasting king, the delight, what the delight in, what he rejoices in, and what pleases him the most from the people that say they trust him, they love him, they believe him, and they are following him. We're looking at number one. What's number one? The decree of an earthly king. We're coming to Daniel chapter 6, and we're looking at verse 25, verse 26. Then, the, then King Darius wrote unto all people, nations, and languages that dwell in all the earth. Peace be multiplied unto you. I make a decree. And why don't you stop this for a moment? Look up for brothers and sisters. And sometimes there are people that think that once there's a problem, there's no solution. And King Darius had that dilemma, that difficulty. He had signed an unrighteous decree. That anybody that will pray to any God beside him will be thrown into the last den. And then Daniel prayed. And when Daniel prayed, all those princes and persecutors, presidents, they came and they said, we found him praying. Now he must be thrown into the lion's den. And the king Darius wanted him delivered. He, wa he didn't want him to go to the lion's den. But then they told him, remember that there is, a, there is a law in the, among the Medes and the Persians. Any law and any decree that is signed by the king cannot be reversed. And uh, so he didn't know what to do. What if he had prayed to God? What if he had asked God? What if he had said, oh Lord, I'm in a dilemma. I'm at, at a crossroad. I've signed a decree ignorantly. And I don't know what to do now. What am I going to do? The Lord could have told him, make another decree. Leave other decree alone. And just say, there's another decree now. Anybody that will touch a man of God. Anybody that will enjoy a man of God. Anybody that will speak anything against the God of heaven. And any of his servants. He will be dealt with this way. And if you will make that new decree. 
that new decree will cancel the other decree without touching the other decree. But he didn't know. And anytime you have a problem, never tell me there's no solution. Never tell me that already I'm in at a crossroad. Already I'm in a dilemma. And something has been done that cannot be reversed. There is nothing coming from the devil that cannot be reversed. Every word of Satan against your life will be reversed. Every decree of the enemy against your life will be reversed in Jesus' name. Oh, they might have said, we have sealed it up. And we have signed it up. And it cannot be changed. There is a God in heaven that has the wisdom, that can give us the wisdom and the strength and the power will change everything. And now he makes this decree. Let's look at verse 26 again. I make a decree that in every dominion of my kingdom, men tremble and fear before the God of Daniel, for he is the living God. And let's look at that now, this exhortation, this decree to tremble and to fear before the living God. Is that peculiar to just Darius? Is that peculiar to Daniel chapter 6, verse 26? Let's look at Deuteronomy chapter 4. Deuteronomy chapter 4. And let us see what the scripture has to say concerning this. Deuteronomy chapter 4, I'm reading to you from verse 7. In verse 7 it says, For what nation is there so great who has God so near unto them as the Lord our God is in all things that we call upon him for. And what nation is there so great that has the statutes and the judgment so righteous as all this law which I set before you this day only take heed to thyself and keep thy soul diligently lest thou forget the things which thine eyes have seen and lest they depart from thy heart all the days of thy life. Listen to this now. But teach them thy sons and thy sons' sons, especially the day that thou stoodest before the Lord thy God in Horeb, when the Lord said unto me, Gather me, the people together, and I will make them hear my words, that they may learn to do what? To do what? For how long? You see that? God said, gather them together and teach them and instruct them and lead them into the knowledge of the Almighty that they may learn to fear me all the days that they live upon the earth and that they may teach their children. Do you see what the Lord desires? Do you see what he demands? Do you see what he wants? And do you see what he has ordained in the world that will learn to fear him all the days of our lives? And if you are really born again, and that's what the Lord plans in our hearts. If you are really sanctified, that's what the Lord plans in our hearts. If you are filled with the Holy Ghost, that's what the Lord leads us to. That he makes you to learn to fear the name of the Lord. We're looking at chapter 6 of Deuteronomy. Chapter 6 of Deuteronomy, verse 24, verse 25. And the Lord commanded us to do all these statutes. And to fear the Lord our God. This commandment. He said the Lord commanded us. When he delivered us. When he rescued us. When he purchased us. When he took us out of the land of captivity. And he brought us unto himself. This is the commandment he gave us. He said have you seen what I've done? When I see the blood I'll pass over you. And then I've taken the judgment away from you. And then I've opened the Red Sea. And then you passed over. I've been feeding you with manna every day. And water out of the rock I've given you to drink. Do you know why I've done that? And then I've given you my word from the Mount of Horeb. Why have I done that? To make you to learn to fear me all the days of your life. Life. And then he tells us in verse 25, and it shall be our righteousness if we observe to do all these commandments before the Lord our God as he has commanded us. We're looking at chapter 31 of Deuteronomy. Deuteronomy chapter 31, we're reading from verse 12 and verse 13. 
Chapter 31, verse 12. Gather the people together, men and women and children and a stranger that is within thy gates. I want you to notice that. It's not only the men. You know, sometimes uh, some of the young people will say, hey, that belongs to the adults. That belongs to mommy and daddy. That belongs to the ministers. That belongs to the preachers. Look at this and see what the Lord has said. That this is not just for the adults. Adults only are not for heaven. The youths are also for heaven. Am I right? And the children are for heaven. Is that right? And if we're going to spend eternity with God in heaven, there's something that must be in our heart. We must have the honor for God, the reverence for God, the respect for God, and we must fear God. That's what he's saying here. Gather them together, the people, the men and the women and the children and a stranger that is within thy gates, that they may hear and that they may learn and fear the Lord your God and observe to do all the words of this law. You know, there are some young people that say, when I grow older, I'll serve the Lord, I'll fear the Lord. No, it's at this time. You honor the Lord and you remember the Lord in the days of your youth. You don't know when the call will come for you to come home. You don't know when the rapture will take place. This is the day of salvation. And this is the acceptable time. And you will not say, no, when I get older, that's the time I'll be serious with the word of the Lord. When I get older, that's the time I'll fear the Lord. That's the time I will learn to serve the Lord. It says the men and the women and the children, the stranger. Sometimes you have somebody living with you. And this might be a maid or a servant or a house help and then we're coming to church and so daddy you can go mommy you can go i came here just to work i don't want you you know fear the lord or serve the lord it says that stranger that's also with you it says they will hear and they will learn and fear the lord your god and also to do all the words of this law in verse 13 and that their children which have not known anything that's the babies that cannot even understand at this time, when they find us, those who have been before them, fearing the Lord, honoring the Lord, as they're growing up too, they'll be fearing the Lord. And their children, which have not known anything, may hear and learn to fear the Lord your God, as long as ye live in the land, whither ye go over Jordan to possess it. You'll find them from the word of God that this is what the Lord has told us. Whether we're young or old, whether we're daddies or mommies or children, boys or girls, we're supposed to get saved. And in that salvation, that salvation will put the fear of God in your heart. And you want to live to the glory of God, to the honor of the almighty God. In Second Chronicles chapter 19. Second Chronicles chapter 19. I'm reading from verse 6 and verse 7 and verse 9. Second Chronicles chapter 19 verse 6. And he said to the judges, Take heed what ye do. For ye judge not for man, but for the Lord who is with you in all the judgment. He's telling the judges now. He's telling the leaders now. He's telling counselors. He's telling people that have to direct other people, judge other people, control other people. He's telling people that have to lead other people. You're doing this for the Lord in verse 7. Wherefore, let now the fear of the Lord be upon you. You see that? Everything we do in the house of God everything we do in the corporation in the places we are working everything we do directing people controlling people and teaching instructing people we do it in the fear of the Lord verse 7 wherefore now let the fear of the Lord be upon you and take heed and do it for there is no iniquity with the Lord our God and no respect of persons nor taking of gifts verse 9 and he charged them saying Thus shall ye do in the fear of the Lord faithfully and with a perfect heart. So then we know that the exhortation that King Darius gave to fear and to tremble before the Lord was not only found in Daniel, but in several other texts of Scripture. 
we should not confuse the exhortation not to fear God with the passages of encouragement that command us not to fear. You know, some people say, but the, but the word of God says, fear not, fear not many, many times. Don't you understand that? It's saying that whatever challenges you have and whatever men may do and whatever demons may bring up, it's saying, fear not because the presence of God is with you. Fear not because the provision of the Lord is available for you. Fear not because the protection of the Lord is yours. It's just telling us, do not fear men. Do not fear your colleagues. Do not fear your children. Do not fear your students. If you're a teacher, still stand by the word of God. Do not fear members of the church. That's what he's saying. Do not fear the enemies. Do not fear circumstances. Do not fear the trials or the things present or the things to come in the future. That's what God is saying. He's not saying don't fear God. When he says fear not, just means don't fear men. Don't fear enemies. Don't fear old people. As if, you know, they can hurt me, they can kill me, they can curse me, they can throw this. Fear not. Because the Lord is protecting you. I said the Lord is protecting you. And he'll preserve your life in Jesus' name. But don't confuse that fear not with fearing God. We must fear God. I said we must fear God. Because God is a great God. Even though we don't fear men, yet we fear God. In fact, God himself requires that, demands that. The scriptural fear of God is a fear of causing grief in the heart of our Heavenly Father who is our God. It's a fear, I don't want to offend God. I don't want to grieve His heart. I don't want to offend Him. That's a fear. It's a fear of bringing divine wrath and judgment upon ourselves. I don't want to do that lest I bring the judgment and the wrath of God upon myself. That's the fear He's talking about. It's a fear of giving occasion to the enemies of the Lord to blaspheme. If a person, for example, who has been known to be a child of God, who has been known to be a preacher of the gospel, who has been known to be a, a righteous man, a righteous woman, if that man or woman will go and commit adultery, for example, fornication, and all the neighbors say, ah, so that can happen, and then the people will bl blaspheme in the name of the Lord, but you fear God. You don't want to do that so that your action, your lifestyle will not bring reproach or blasphemy against the Almighty God. The fear we're talking talking about is a fear of misleading our own children and leading them into hellfire. You want to be careful as a father, as a mother, that you don't say anything at home, do anything at home, act in any way that your children will say, well, if daddy can do that, maybe we can do that too. And if mommy can go that direction, maybe we can go that direction too. And then your children will go to hell because of your example. That's the fear we're talking about. That you fear God so much and say, I'm not going to do anything to lead any of these, my children, astray so that they don't go to hell through me is the fear of becoming a stumbling block to the brethren and destroying the souls for whom Jesus Christ died. Your fear that no, I don't want to do that. No, I don't want to go that direction. No, I don't want to drink that, that kind of thing. So that I don't mislead other believers that you look at my example and then do that. That's the fear we're talking about. You fear so you don't become a stumbling block for other people. You fear missing heaven and the promised inheritance. You say, I've had the word of God. I have to live a careful life. I have to live a righteous life. I fear lest I will go astray and backslide and then me seven. Let's look at Hebrews chapter 4 verse 1. Hebrews chapter 4 verse 1. And you see the kind of fear the Lord is talking about. Hebrews chapter 4 verse 1. Let us therefore fear. You see that uh, the apostle is writing to the Hebrew believers and he's saying let us even the apostles and the believers and the preachers all alike included. Let us therefore fear lest a promise being left us of entering into his rest any of you should seem to come short of it. That's the fear we're talking about. That you're afraid, you fear, so that you don't allow an evil heart of unbelief to spring up in your heart, making you to go astray, to backslide, and then miss heaven eventually. 
This is the fear of the Lord that makes us to hate evil and to depart from evil. When you have that kind of fear, the one that the scripture is talking about, you see evil coming, you hide yourself. You run away from evil because of the fear you have for the Lord. We're looking at Proverbs chapter 8 verse 13. Proverbs chapter 8 and we're reading from verse 13. The fear of the Lord is to hate evil. That's it. That's it. The fear of the Lord. When it says that men shall fear and tremble before God, you fear God so much, and you know that God is faithful to his word. He will keep his word. There's no respect of a person. If an angel in heaven sins, it drives him away and drives him to hell. If a Lucifer sins, it drives him away and he becomes Satan. And then the chains of uh, judgment will bind him and eventually get him to hell and you know that if God will not spare the greatest of the angels and the holiest of men if they offend him and they go astray and backslide then you say huh, uh, I fear that fear of the Lord makes you to depart from evil that's why it says in Proverbs chapter 8 verse 13 the fear of the Lord is to hate evil pride and arrogancy and the evil way and the forward mouth do I hate we're looking at chapter 3 of Proverbs of Proverbs, Proverbs chapter 3 verse 7. In Proverbs chapter 3 verse 7, be not wise in thine own eyes. Fear the Lord and depart from evil. Fear the Lord and depart from evil. The fear of the Lord makes us to so fear him. We run away where he will depart from evil. We're coming to point number two now. The demand of the eternal king. The demand of the eternal king. We're looking at Daniel again. Daniel chapter 6. I'm reading from verse 26. Daniel chapter 6. Verse 26. I make a decree. That in every dominion of my kingdom. Men tremble and fear. Before the God of Daniel. For he is the living God. Wait for a moment. Look up here brothers and sisters. You know if you remember that Darius. Darius was not a Jew. He was not an Israelite. It's like he's coming from a foreign place. Because he was uh, from the kingdom of the, of the Medes and the Persians. That's why they said. Remember that the law of the Medes and the Persians. They alter not. They change not. And even though he was not an Israelite. He saw the power. The manifestation of the power of the God of Israel. The God of Daniel. The God of the Jews. And he said. I abandon my own gods. I abandon my own eyes. Idols. I do not fear my own idols anymore. There is only one God and is the living God. All the other gods are dead gods and therefore I now make a decree that men, all men in my kingdom, they will fear this God of Daniel, the living God. What if you're a manager? Can't you do that and influence the people in your company, your corporation to fear the Lord, to serve the Lord? What if you're a father? What if you have many children? If Darius can do that for his whole kingdom, for his whole dominion, can't you as a father say in this house, we want to fear the Lord, we want to serve the Lord? What if you're a pastor? Will you just leave the members of your church just like that? Whatever you want to do, you can do. If you want to love God, love God, if you want to fear God, fear God. If you want to get near God, get near God. As for me, I want to serve the Lord and fear the Lord. I don't want any trouble. I don't want any conflict. I don't want any kind of authority on anybody. You can do whatever you want. Darius said, no. I make a decree that if you're in my kingdom, if you're in my territory, everyone in every nation under my kingdom, you will serve the Lord. You will fear this God of Daniel. What a challenge that if you're a leader of a people, you not just leave them to themselves and say, well, whatever you want to do. I know that young people of nowadays, they don't like to take instruction and they don't like to listen to any directives and they don't like to listen to any teaching of the word of God. Therefore, whatever you people want to do is in your hand. You can take the loss in your hand and do what Whatever you want. No. Darius said, if you're in my kingdom, in my dominion, you'll fear the Lord. And thank God in this church, you'll fear the Lord. I said, we'll fear the Lord. 
and in order in the zone, the zona leader will not just leave everybody, do whatever you want. You tell them, serve the Lord and fear the Lord. Sectional leaders, you'll not just leave people to do whatever they want. You say, serve the Lord and fear the Lord. Daddies and mommies, you will not just leave your children and say, go to any church you want and serve any God you want to serve. No, you say, as for me and my house, we're going to serve, we're going to fear the Lord. And the people who have any authority over any group of people, you're going to encourage them. Do everything you can do to make them to love the Lord and to fear the Lord. It says in that verse 26, I make a decree that in every dominion of my kingdom, men fear and tremble before the God of Daniel, for he is the living God. By the way, this is not just of that earthly king. It's also what the eternal king himself has said. Let's look at Deuteronomy once again, chapter 5. Deuteronomy chapter 5. I'm reading from verse 29. Deuteronomy chapter 5, verse 29. Oh, that there was such an heart in them that they would fear me. And, uh, and keep all my commandments always that it might be well with them and with their children forever. You see that? It says, oh, that there was such a heart in them that they will fear me, their God, their Redeemer, who delivered them out of the captivity of Egypt. And then it says, that will be for their good. It will be well with them forever. It will be well with us. When looking at uh, Deuteronomy chapter 10, verse 12, Deuteronomy chapter 10, verse 12. Here it says, And now Israel, what does the Lord thy God require of thee? O Israel, your God who has redeemed you, your God who has pardoned you, your God who has saved you, what has he required of you? But to fear the Lord your God, and to walk in all his ways, and to love him, and to serve the Lord thy God with all thy heart and with all thy soul. And that's what the Lord required. And God is your creator. is requiring that from you. God is your redeemer. is requiring that from you. The Lord Jesus, the son of the living God, is your savior. is your sin bearer. is your substitute. is the one that made the atonement for you. And he died for you on the cross of Calvary. And because of what he has done, because of his atonement, and because of the pain, the agony, the suffering, he went through for you. He sin, fear the Lord your God. God, to walk in all his ways and to keep all his commandments all the days of your life. We're looking at verse 20 there, that thou shalt fear the Lord thy God. Him shalt thou serve, and to him shalt thou cleave and swear by his name. It says everything you do now will have reference to the almighty God. It says, I cannot do anything, I cannot go any direction except as the Lord is guiding me and leading me because of the fear I have for the Lord, if you are a child of God, that ought to be in your mind. That ought to be in your heart. That ought to be your attitude. That ought to be your disposition. That everything you do, it will be in the fear of God. Everywhere you go, it will be in the fear of God. Everything you think about, it will be in the fear of God. Everything you plan, it will be in the fear of God. And every association you have, it will be in the fear of God. Any kind of friendship you have, it will be in the, in the fear of God. If you are going to have any friends... That will make you not to have the fear of God. That will make you careless. Make you frivolous. Make you throw the word of God behind you. Make you just to do whatever you want without any fear and without any consciousness of who God is. Say, no, I cannot have a friend like that. I cannot go that direction. Even in marriage, you're proposing marriage to somebody and you know this fellow is acting as if he doesn't fear God. He talks anyhow, he acts anyhow, he drinks anything and eats anything. And you can tell. And when you say, but God said, but the word of God said, but what have I got to do with that? You don't want to be in fellowship with anyone that doesn't have the fear of God. You want to see the people that fear God. And those are the people you want to associate with. If you want the blessing of God upon your life. In fact, the Lord himself in Malachi chapter 1 verse 6 is asking the question. You call me a father, you call me a master. Where is my fear? Malachi chapter 1, we're looking at verse 6. Malachi chapter 1. 
We're looking at verse 6. And you see, therefore, there is the demand of the eternal king. There is the demand of the almighty God himself. His son honoreth the father, and his, and his servant is master. If I then be a father, where is mine honor? If you say you are a child of God, Jesus is your savior, and God is your heavenly father, he says, where is my honor? And if I be a master, where is my fear? That's the almighty God himself saying that. He won't say it. He demands it. He commands it. And because of that, we have to render that unto him. And it says, it says, it says the Lord of hosts unto you, O priest, that despise my name. And, and, sees, uh, and you say, wherein have we despised thy name? Again, there might be people there that are thinking, maybe that's just the Old Testament. And when you are saved, after all, when you are saved and your sins are forgiven, why do you have to fear the Lord? Do you know something? when your sins have been forgiven and you have that assurance that your sins are taken away that is the time to actually fear the Lord that you are forgiven your sins are taken away there is no condemnation anymore and then you say this God, this mighty God is so mighty and so loving and so compassionate he sent his only begotten son to die for me on the cross of Calvary that is the very reason to fear the Lord. We're looking at Psalm 130, Psalm 130. Psalm 130. I'm reading from verse 4. Psalm 130, verse 4. But there is forgiveness with thee. But there is forgiveness with thee. That's what we have at salvation, at conversion, when the Lord has taken all our sins away. And it says, We well, thank you, Lord. We bless your name. We glorify you because there is forgiveness with thee. Look at the latter part of that verse. Let's read that together. Psalm 130, verse 4. Won't you go? That thou mayest be feared. You see that? The forgiveness doesn't mean that now we just belittle God. We become familiar with God. And we don't fear him anymore. No. After we are forgiven, then it says that thou mayest be feared. I about after we are sanctified, now I'm sanctified. The Adamic nature is taken away. He has made me holy. He has given me a new heart, another heart. What's the implication of that? Does that mean now, since I'm sanctified, no fear of God anymore? Look at Jeremiah chapter 32. Jeremiah chapter 32. I'm reading from verse 39. I will give them one heart, this sanctification, and one way that they may fear me forever for the good of them and of their children after them. When we're saved and forgiven, we fear God. When we're sanctified and purified and purged, and the Adamic nature is taken away, we keep on fearing God. In verse 40, and I will make an everlasting covenant with them, that I will not turn away from them to do them good, but I will put my fear in their hearts, that they shall not depart from me. When we're saved, we'll keep on fearing God. And when we're sanctified, of course, we'll keep on fearing the Lord. What, what, what if the Holy Ghost then comes upon our lives? And now we're saturated and filled and baptized in the Holy Ghost. Now a person that is baptized in the Holy Ghost... Filled with the Holy Ghost, and the Holy Ghost in dwelling him, does he have to fear God? Of course, yes. Saved is fearing God. Sanctified truly is fearing God. Baptized in the Holy Ghost is fearing God. We're looking at Acts of the Apostles, chapter 9. Acts chapter 9, I'm reading there from verse 31. Acts chapter 9, verse 31. Then at the churches rest throughout all Judea and Galilee and Samaria, and were edified. Walking in the fear of the Lord and in the comfort of the Holy Ghost were multiplied. Jesus said, it's expedient for you that I go away. If I go not away, the comforter will not come unto you. But I will go to the Father and I will pray unto the Father. And he shall give you the comforter, the spirit of truth. And he will abide with you forever. These ones, they are the comfort of the Holy Ghost. That means they were baptized in the Holy Ghost. And as they were baptized, it says, they were walking in the fear of the Lord. Which means then, the more we know the Lord, and the nearer we get to it, the Lord, and the more we experience the Lord saved, sanctified, filled with the Holy Ghost, we'll be walking in the fear 
of the Lord. The word of God has commanded us, fear God. Fear the living God. Fear the Lord. Fear the Lord your God. Fear him. Angels demand it. Christ demands it. God, the eternal king himself, demands it. From the beginning of divine revelation to the very end, it is demanded that we fear God and honor him. And we give him the glory that is due to his name. This is the whole duty of man. It is the salt that seasons every other duty. What that means is anything you do without the fear of God is not recognized by God. It might be like a good deed. It might be like a serviceable thing that you have done. It might be like a wonderful thing you have done, but you've done it without the fear of God. You just do it. And God is not reckoned with His word, His commandment, and His fear is not reckoned with. All that that you do without the fear of God is not having any any recognition from the Almighty God. There is no duty performed by us that can be of any, any that can by any means be accepted of God if it be not seasoned with God honoring respect and reverence and godly fear. Only the worship, only the obedience, only the service, only the faithfulness, only the sacrifice, only the zeal, only the ministry which flows from the fountain of godly reverential fear in the heart is acceptable to God and rewardable by Him. And the acceptable fear of God is first begotten in the heart when we are wakened and convicted of our sins and their consequence. Then do we cry out, sirs, what must I do to be saved? It is this fear that drives us to Christ, seeking salvation with a firm decision to flee from the wrath to come, now saved and abiding in Christ. It is this gracious, godly fear that makes us steadfast in the Lord, consecrating ourselves to Him and promising to serve Him till the end of our lives. That's according to the promise that the Lord Almighty God Himself has given. I will put my fear in their hearts that they shall not depart from me. It's this glorious godly fear, the divine gift of the fear of the Lord in our hearts that makes us to uh, go away from evil and also to lose the fear of man which brings us near. When you fear God, you're not going to fear any man. You'll be able to say, I'm not, I will not fear what man shall do unto me. Then shall we be able to declare with firm and wavering purpose of heart, we ought to be God rather than men. Is that your decision? Let's look at Acts of the Apostles, chapter 5, verse 29. Acts chapter 5. We're looking at verse 29. The Pharisees, the members of Sanhedrin, they expected that these children of God will fear them. But he said, no, we ought to fear God rather than men. Acts chapter 5, verse 29. Then Peter and the other apostles answered and said, we ought to fear God rather than men. I pray that will be your decision in Jesus' name. Now, I've been explaining to you that, that we're children of God and we're in the New Testament era does not mean that we do not fear God. In fact, we're told in Hebrews chapter 12, verse 28, Hebrews chapter 12, we're looking at verse 20, wherefore we receiving a kingdom which cannot be moved. Obviously, those are New Testament believers. Obviously, these are real children of God. Obviously, these are people that have trusted in the Lord. And they knew that their sins were taken away. And it says, we receiving a kingdom which cannot be moved. Let us have grace whereby we may serve God acceptably with reverence and with what? Godly fear. Children of God with godly fear. Why? For our God is a consuming fire. It's not only the unbelievers that show fear, that consuming fire. Even the children of God. Because God is watching our lives. And he's seeing, he's looking at how real, how sincere our worship, our experience in the Lord is. Because of that he says, let us fear God. Let us have grace whereby we may serve the Lord with reverence and godly fear for our God is a consuming for Ecclesiastes chapter 12. Ecclesiastes chapter 12. And now the word of God is saying of all the word we have been hearing. This is the conclusion. This is a summary. Ecclesiastes chapter 12 verse 13. Let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. The conclusion of everything. 
Now, the writer of uh, the Ecclesiastes, Samaritan, from chapter 1, and he's reading quite a lot about other things, what takes place under the sun, what our attitude should be, what our life should be, what our disposition should be, how we should love God and serve God and obey God, how we should let our Christian faith, our appreciation of what the Lord has done, how we should let all our service of the Lord affect all our actions. And he says, now, everything you have heard, everything I've written, everything you have thought about, everything that's applicable to your life, here is the conclusion of the whole matter. This is the conclusion of the whole matter. Fear God and keep His commandments. Now, when you fear God, you'll keep the commandments of God. If anybody says, I fear God, but he is nonchalant concerning the commandments of God, is disobedient and rebellious to the commandments of God, that's a liar. He doesn't fear God. The fear of God will make us to keep the commandments of God. Fear God and keep His commandments. For this is the whole duty of man. For God shall bring every work into judgment. And with every secret sin, whether it be good or whether it be evil. I pray God will give us the grace to keep to that word of God in Jesus' name. We're coming to point number three now. The delight of the everlasting king. The delight of the everlasting king. This is what he rejoices in. This is what he desires. And this is what he delights in. When he finds a man, a woman, a boy, a girl, a youth, a child, serving the Lord, fearing the Lord, being conscious of the word of God, and being conscious of the demand of the Lord, and walking in the fear of the Lord, careful that I don't want to offend God. I want to serve the Lord with all honesty and sincerity. God delights in such a man, in such a woman, in such a youth, in such a child. We're looking at Daniel chapter 6. Daniel chapter 6, I'm reading from verse 26. I make a decree that in every dominion of my kingdom, men tremble and fear before the God of Daniel, the living God. God delights in that. God, the everlasting king, delights in those who fear him. And in the divinely appointed way, the fear of the Lord is imparted into our hearts to uh, for our good. That's what we're told in Jeremiah. At the great privilege of the of divine delights is reserved for those who fear the Lord, both in this world and in that which is to come. The Lord is the help and the shield of all who fear him. Let's look at Psalm 115. Psalm 115, we're looking at verse 11. God shows his delight in the people that fear him by what he does for them. Psalm 115 verse 11. Ye that fear the Lord, trust in the Lord. He is their help and their shield. That's how he reveals that he loves them. He delights in them. He rejoices in them. He appreciates them because he is their shield and he is their help. Now, supernatural help and shield will be the special grant and peculiar privilege for those who fear the Lord. Those who truly fear the Lord shall receive unfailing help in times of weakness and in times of infirmity. They will also have heaven's shield of protection against all the assaults of the devil and his messengers. God has also declared concerning the believer who fears him that he will be his teacher, his guide, and counselor at every crossroad in life. Such a God-fearing believer will never lack the wisdom to choose the right way. What a wonderful thing to be taught of God. What a wonderful thing to be led of God. And what a glorious thing to be directed by God. What a great privilege that at the crossroads of life, the Lord will be directing and leading because you fear the Lord. Psalm 25, I'm reading from verse 12. Psalm 25, looking at verse 12. What man is he that feareth the Lord? Him shall he teach in the way that he shall choose. There will be no confusion in your life. And there will be no anxiety in your life. There will be no worry because you know. Because you fear the Lord. Here is the promise of the Lord. That he himself will teach you in the way that you will choose. Do you truly fear the Lord? Then the word of God says he'll open a secret unto you. Things which are kept secret from the worldly wise men of the world. And from the earthbound prudent men on earth will be revealed unto you. Look 
look at verse 14 of that Psalm 25. Verse 14. The secret of the Lord is with them that fear Him. The secret of the Lord is with them that fear Him. When you trust the Lord and fear the Lord and you are careful in your life and you are sincere, walking in holiness and righteousness and you don't do anything that you know God will frown at, the Lord says, look at Him. He fears me. Look at Him. He honors me. He exalts me. And because of that, I will reveal my secret unto Him. And I will show him his covenant. That's the promises given to the people that fear and love him. I pray that promise will be ours in Jesus' name. What a marvelous thing that he does those wondrous uh, hidden things and he gives us those things which will not give to the casual fellow and to the careless one and to the carnal people all those things that the careless and the carnal and the careless will not know he will reveal unto us. In fact, he even says that as a shepherd watches over his own sheep, he is protecting and watching over us because we fear the Lord. Psalm 33, I'm reading from verse 18, verse Verse 19. Psalm 33, verse 18. Behold, the eye of the Lord is upon them that fear him, upon them that hope in his mercy. If you if you have your mind on God, your heart on God, and you fear God and you honor God and you reverence God, and you are walking carefully in the commandments of the Lord, it says He will He will protect you as a shepherd is watching over his own sheep. In fact, he tells us in verse 19 to deliver their soul from death and to to keep them alive in famine. I pray that this fear of the Lord that will bring protection and preservation will be upon our lives in Jesus' name. In fact, he goes on to say that he'll send his angel. And his angel will preserve and protect us if we will fear the Lord. You know, the people that do not fear the Lord, they are missing a lot in life. They are missing the care of the Lord. They are missing the provision of the Lord. They are missing the privilege of being cared for and being protected by the Lord. When you fear the Lord and you honor him and you walk according to the commandments of the Lord, if there's sin in your life, you repent of that sin, you turn away from that sin, you say, I know God is a, is a, is a righteous God, is a just God. God is an impartial God. He's not going to overlook sin anywhere. And because you know that, that is no respect of persons, you turn away from sin in the fear of the Lord. And you seek the forgiveness of the Lord. And you say, yes, Lord, I believe Jesus died for me on the cross of Calvary. And you want to take the privilege of the cleansing of the Lamb, the cleansing of the blood of the Lamb, the atonement. When you take that, then the mercy of God comes upon you. And then after that, now that you're sins are forgiven. You say, I don't want to offend God anymore. Grant me grace and grant me strength that I will live in the strength and the grace of the Lord in righteousness and holiness all the days of my life, walking in the fear of the Lord. That's when he'll send his angel to protect you and preserve you. And I pray that this good mind of the real believer, the Lord will give unto every one of us in Jesus' name. In Psalm 34, I'm reading from verse 7. Psalm 34, verse 7, the angel of the Lord and campeth around them that do what? That fear him. That's it. That fear him. It's not for the careless. It's not for the one that says, I don't care what God says. I don't care what they teach. I don't care what they say. I don't care how many references of the Bible they read. I'm just going to do whatever I want to do. No, the protection of the Lord is not upon such people, but it says, the angel of the Lord encompass round about them that fear him and delivereth them. I pray that will be for every one of us in Jesus' name. In Psalm 103, I'm reading from verse 13. The mercy of the Lord is also available for the people that fear the Lord. In Psalm 103 verse 13. 103 verse 13. Like as a father pitieth his children, so the Lord pitieth them that do what? That fear him. Always, they're always like that. You see that the people that do not fear God, they're missing quite a lot. The people that just live carelessly, they, they might read the Bible. They're not going to obey what they read there. They might listen to a message like this. They're not going to obey the word of God. They miss a lot in life. And they're going to miss a lot in eternity. But the people that fear the Lord, the people that count the word of God serious, and the people that want to walk in the fear of God, in everything, every decision they take, and every word they speak, 
and every action of their lives. Those are the people that the pity of the Lord, the compassion of the Lord, the mercy of the Lord will be abundantly present in their lives. In Psalm 145, Psalm 145, we're looking at verse 19. Psalm 145. Verse 19, he will fulfill the desire of them that do what? That fear him. You have desires, you have aspirations, you have ambition. You say, I want to be this, I want to be that, I want to have this, I want to have that. And I want the Lord to help me. How is, how is the Lord going to help you? If you don't give your heart to the Lord Jesus Christ, how is the Lord going to help you? If you throw the word of God behind you over your shoulders, how is the Lord going to help you and fulfill your desires? If everything you are hearing from the word of God, you say, I don't care about that. All I want is the help of God. No, it doesn't come like that if you want your prayers to be answered if you want your desires to be fulfilled if you want your aspirations to be realized if you want success in life if you want all the prayers you are praying to be answered by the lord and you know that with god all things are possible and he wants to accomplish this in your life he says there is something i'm demanding from you it's what i delight in you will fear the lord that's why it says he will fulfill the desire of them that fear him he also will hear their cry and will save them. I pray that that will be our attitude in Jesus' name. We're looking at Psalm 147, Psalm 147 verse 11. Psalm 147 verse 11. The Lord taketh pleasure in them that fear him. The Lord taketh pleasure, taketh delight in them that fear him, in those that hope in his mercy. And we're looking at uh, Genesis chapter 22. The Lord had demanded of Abraham to do something. And this is what an ordinary fellow would have uh, kind of withdrawn from. And he would have said, no, I don't want to go that far. But because of his fear for the Lord, the fear of the Lord in his heart, he did what the Lord demanded of him. And because he did that in the fear of the Lord, it wasn't a popular thing. It wasn't a, a common thing that the Lord demanded of him. But he said, I fear the Lord so much. I honor the Lord so much. I exalt the Lord so much. I reverence the Lord so much that whatever he tells me to do, common or uncommon, regular or irregular, reasonable or unreasonable, expected or unexpected, whatever it is, it demands of me, I am going to do it. That's the reason why the Lord said now, I'm going to bless you beyond everybody else. In Genesis chapter 22, I'm reading from verse 11. And the angel of the Lord called unto him out of heaven and said, Abraham, Abraham. And he said, here am I. And he said, lay not that and hand upon the lad, neither do thou anything unto him. For now I know that thou what? Fear is God. Now I know, now I know. It's by the action that we'll know whether we fear God or not. It's by the obedience we give to the word of the Lord. We'll know whether we fear God or not. It's for, uh, by the reverence and the honor, the respect we give unto the Lord that will make us to know whether we fear the Lord or not. Others may not be there. Others were not there. It was Abraham alone with Isaac. And he sacrificed, were willing to sacrifice that Isaac unto the Lord. Even though there was nobody else encouraging him, pushing him, leading him, guiding him. He said, even though there is nobody encouraging me to do this, I'm going to do this to the honor, to the glory of my God. Because I fear him. And that's why now the Lord sent the angel to say, now I know that you fear God, seeing thou hast not withheld thy son, thine only son from me. And Abraham lifted up his eyes and looked, and behold, behind him a ram caught in a thicket by his horns. And Abraham went and took the ram and offered him up for a burnt offering in the stead of his son. And Abraham called the name of that place Jehovah Jireh, as it is said unto this day in the mount of the Lord. It shall be seen. And the angel of the Lord called.
called unto Abraham out of heaven the second time and said, By myself have I sworn, says the Lord, for because thou hast done this and hast not withheld thy son, then only son that in blessing I will bless thee. And in multiplying, I will multiply thy seed as the stars of the heaven and, and, and as the sand which is upon the seashore. And thy seed shall possess the gate of his enemies. And in thy, st- in thy seed shall all the nations of the earth be blessed because thou hast obeyed my voice. You see that God delighted so much in that obedience and because of that he gave him great, great blessings. If we will do the same thing and obey the Lord, even when our neighbors, our colleagues, our peers, our friends may not understand the commandment of the Lord and they say this is uncommon, this is unreasonable, this is unexpected and yet we keep on obeying the Lord in spite of what our friends and what our neighbors say, the blessings of God will be multiplied in our lives. Give me a good, good amen. amen. Malachi chapter 3. I'm reading from verse 16. Malachi chapter 3. We're looking at verse 16. It says, Then they that feared the Lord. They that feared the Lord. These were not careless people. And these were not carnal people. These were not people that said, No, we don't care what the word of God says. These were people that cared. The people that honored the Lord. And the people that said, We're going to live a life that shows we have the fear of God that makes us to depart from people and from evil. And it says, Then they that feared the Lord speak often one to another. And the Lord hacking and heard each, and a book of remembrance was written before him for them that fear the Lord and thought upon his name. When you fear the Lord and it shows in your action, in your lifestyle, in your community, your life is a life that shows the fear of God in your house, in the privacy of your room. Your life shows that you fear the Lord in the midst of your friends, the things you say. The things you do, it shows you have the fear of the Lord. In the church of the living God, in the very presence of the Almighty God, your action shows that you fear the Lord. It says, a book of remembrance is written concerning such people that fear the Lord. And they shall be mine, says the Lord of hosts, in that day when I make up my joys, and I will spare them as a man spareth his own son that serveth him. Then shall you return and discern between the righteous and the wicked between him that serveth God and him that serveth him not. Malachi chapter 4 verses 2 and 3. Malachi chapter 4 verses 2 and 3. But unto you that do what? That fear my name. You see how many promises the Lord has left for those people who are conscious of the presence of God and they say I don't want to do anything in my life that God will see and be unhappy ways. Whether small or great, my thoughts, my action, my lifestyle, my language, my utterance, my disposition, my relationship, my interaction with people, anything I do, gaining money, getting money, walking, giving out or whatever, going out with people. I'm not going to have any association or friendship that God is not happy with. They fear the Lord. And it says in verse 2, but unto you that fear my name shall the son of righteousness arise with healing in his wings and ye shall go forth and grow up as cows of the stall, and ye shall tread down the wicked. For they shall be ashes under the soles of your feet, and for in that day shall I do in, for in that day that, in the day that I shall do this, says the Lord of hosts. I pray that this same fear of the Lord will be upon our hearts in Jesus' name. We're looking at Acts of the Apostles, chapter 10. Acts, chapter 10. You know, there are people that they've been saved and uh, they have been sanctified. And they have been praying for the Holy Ghost, baptism for a long time. And they say, I don't know why. I prayed and prayed and prayed. I do not have the baptism of the Holy Ghost. Why don't you check off whether the fear of God is missing in your life or not? Maybe you are not committing open sin and outward sin and plant grant sin, but maybe the fear of God is not really deep in your heart. 
and you know, there are times you just live carelessly and act carelessly maybe you just need to come deeper into the fear of the Lord because when you have that fear of God then the Lord will delight in you and then he'll pour the blessing upon your life Acts of the Apostles chapter 10 verse 22 Acts chapter 10 verse 22 and they said, Cornelius the centurion, a just man and one that feareth God. A just man and one that feareth God. Look at verse 34. Then Peter opened his mouth and said, Of a truth, I perceive that God is no respecter of persons, but in every nation he that feareth him and walketh righteousness is accepted with him. He that feareth God and walketh righteousness is accepted of him. Look at verse 44. While Peter yet spake these words, the Holy Ghost fell on all them that heard the word. They received the Holy Ghost baptism. The power of the Holy Ghost came upon them because they feared the Lord. The Lord has taught us much today and has told us about the decree of the earthly king and about the demand of the eternal king and about the delight of the everlasting king and that is to fear and tremble before this God and because we fear that God will depart from evil and the Lord is saying if we will do that the blessings of God will be upon our lives the riches of the kingdom will be upon our lives if we will fear the Lord in our action become conscious that this is what God wants and this is what God demands and because of that we want to live according to that fear of God we'll have peace and God will more multiply his blessings in every one of our lives in jesus name let me just remind you once again of the words of the lord jesus christ if you're a child of god you're a follower of christ you'll honor the word of christ and you will want to follow after this word of the lord jesus christ we're looking at luke once again luke chapter 12 and i'm reading from verse 4 and verse 5 and i say unto you my friends are you a friend of christ a follower of christ a believer in christ a real child of god it says i say unto you my friend be not afraid of them which kill the body and after that have no more than they can do but I will forewarn you whom ye shall fear fear him which after he has killed has power to cast into hell yea I say unto you what fear him let's rise up and talk to the Lord in prayer that the Lord is, has taught us today and has called us to really fear the Lord and fear and tremble before this mighty God of heaven and let us stand up and, and pray to the Lord and say Lord here am I today I come before you if you fear the Lord you repent of sin if you fear the Lord you'll not keep on sinning and keep on doing evil without caring about the consequence if you fear the Lord you'll call upon the Lord when Jonah appears in Nineveh and said, Yet forty days, and Nineveh shall be overthrown. The people feared the Lord. They feared the words of the Lord, and they repented of their sins and turned away from their evil. And when God saw that they repented and turned away from their evil, then the Lord said, I will not do that evil sin against them anymore. The judgment of God will pass over. Condemnation will pass away from you. If you will manifest that fear of the Lord and say, Lord, I come before you. Lord, I come before you. The things that I did that were not wrong, I refuse to do them again. Open your mouth and talk to the Lord in prayer. And when God has forgiven you, you are going to manifest that fear of God that makes you to depart from evil. You run away from adultery if you have the fear of God. You run away from fornication if you have the fear of God. If you know that God is watching you. And you know that God is no respecter of persons. You run away from stealing, from lying, from hypocrisy, from evil, from wickedness. If you have the fear of God, the fear of God leads us to repentance. The fear of God leads us to seeking forgiveness before the Lord. The fear of God makes us to want to have a conscience but offense toward God and toward men. Seek the Lord. Call upon the Lord. Look at your life. And say, Lord, what is it I'm doing you are not happy with? Secret sin? Immorality? Evil? 
wickedness, violence, fighting, evil heart of unbelief, you tell the Lord to forgive you. The fear of God makes us to seek the Lord in your family. Is the Lord happy with the way you deal with your wife? The way you act to your husband? The fear of God will make you to re-examine your life and your relationship. Will make you to say, oh Lord, I know that cannot be right. I know this cannot be right. I know this cannot be proper. To make this woman to suffer in this family, I'm sorry for what I've done. You are teaching to your husband, you examine it in the light of the fear of the Lord. What commandment has the Lord given us? How should we respond, react, relate with our husbands? How should we relate with our parents, with our children? You examine your life, your relationship, your interaction. Where is the word of the Lord? And it is the fear of God that makes us to depart from evil, to repent of evil, to turn away from everything that does not please the Lord because we know that our God is a consuming fire. And you know, Jesus Christ can come, will come anytime. And because of that, you want to be ready for the imminent return of the Lord. God is merciful, is kind, is loving, is is a pardoning God, a merciful God, a compassionate God. And whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Then you make a decision to follow after the Lord. Then you say, Lord, I'm going to follow you. I'm going to continue serving you with all my heart, all my soul, all my mind. Doing only that which is pleasing unto you. My place of work, only that which is pleasing unto you. In the midst of believers, only that which is pleasing unto you. In my family, among members of my family, only that which is pleasing unto you. With strangers who have never known me, I'm going to demonstrate the light of the gospel. I'm going to keep, I'm going to keep on obeying the word of God. Even when among strangers... Because of the fear of the Lord. The genuine experience of salvation leads us to so fear the Lord. We don't want to do anything that is evil. Anywhere. Whether people see us or not. We're not living righteous lives because people are watching. We're living righteous lives because God is watching. Our actions are not dictated or controlled by the fear of man, but directed and controlled by the fear of God. He sees us when we're in the dark. He sees us when we're alone. He sees us when no man can see us. In the fear of God that will not allow you to give bride. In the fear of God that will not allow you to say, I want to get out of trouble and therefore do an evil thing, a sinful thing. In the fear of God that guides you, counsels you, controls you, directs you, that you don't want to do anything that God will say, that's not right. Fear the Lord and keep his commandments. Then will he fulfill the desires of your heart, for he will fulfill the desires of all them that fear him. Who is the real Christian? Who is the real believer? Who is the real child of God? A real child of God is the one that lives in the love of God and the fear of God.